couple uh, announcements and in prayer requests. Amen. Um, so we want to remember um, pastors calling for prayer and fasting on Thursday. So this Thursday, tomorrow, take some time for prayer and fasting. Uh, don't forget Sunday, parking lot A, Penn State Hazleton Church. Amen. We're going to meet there at uh, 11 a.m. We're going to have church, parking lot A at Penn State um, Hazleton. And um, our next Tamako service is August 30th at 4 p.m. We're going to be at the YMCA uh, parking lot, so that's August 30th at 4 p.m. And uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to come out for that on um, August 30th. Uh, don't forget about offerings, uh, tithes, um, the, uh, the, your, your mission funds, amen, your mission uh, offerings, your um, building fund offerings. Uh, let's send these in through PayPal, through mail, uh, general offering, amen. And so uh, let's remember that our offerings through PayPal and mail. Um, don't forget daily Bible reading, prayer, and let's remember our CCC ministries, amen. Um, that, you know, a lot of people are starting to move around. We're starting to get out a little bit more. Um, you know, stores are open. Uh, we're, we're out and about. We're doing some stuff. And even if we're not, we're still in contact with people, amen. And that's what CCC ministry is about, is people. So make sure you're reaching out to people. A um, couple prayer requests, a very serious prayer request. Um, baby Jameson was taken off life support today. Um, so let's remember uh, Kelly and her husband, amen. Um, we need to lift up this family. They would touch, feel the touch of God, the, the presence of God, the healing of God, the, the calm and the peace of God, amen. And um, so, uh, so let's remember Kelly and her husband. Um, and uh, let's remember our country. Um, COVID is still very real. Um, we're seeing some fluctuations here and there. Uh, some, you know, universities are deciding to close. Just heard of one. Um, they're, they're testing them. So as they, as they do more tests, they're going to find more positives. Um, and so we want to remember uh, this COVID situation. And it, it is devastating to our country. It's uh, devastating morale. It's devastating families. Um, uh, child abuse is way up. There's more, there's more kids being placed in emergency protection than, um, than, than agencies have ever seen. Um, and so this is a serious situation and it's all related to COVID. And so we need to remember this need. Um, this virus would just be pushed out and be taken care of, amen. Uh, let's remember um, our country for the violence that's still occurring. Um, there, there's protests, there's, there's riots. The protests, um, when they're peaceful, are, are the way we as Americans can uh, move forward, amen. We can make change through proper protest. Um, when it becomes violent and riots, that is, uh, that's anarchy, and our country is being destroyed by it. Um, and so we need the peace of God to come in, amen? This isn't something man can fix, this is something we need God to fix. And um, we, need to, we need to pray about it, we need to lift it up, amen? And so uh, if you have any prayer requests right now, if you'd stand with me right where you're at, and um, just lift up your hands and call your prayer request to God. Amen. Lord, we come before you right now. Jesus, reach down. Jesus, touch us, Lord. Be with our country, Lord God. Lord, touch this COVID situation. The, the violence, Lord God, is running through our country, Lord. Touch us and be with us, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We need you, Jesus. Lord, we're praying, Lord, for Kelly and her husband, Lord God. Lord, what they're going through right now, God. Lord, let them feel your peace, your love, Lord. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We need you to move on our church, Lord God. Lord, keep us safe, Lord God. Lord, let our health be greater than the COVID-19, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, let your hand be upon us, Lord God. Let's feel your peace, your protection. These children are being abused around the world, Lord, because of this virus being locked up and not being able to get out of the home. Violence has taken over and drug abuse is up, Lord God. Lord, we need you to move, Lord. Lord, this is an attack, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, move on our country. Move on the people, Lord God. Let there be a mighty revival, Jesus. Lord, we come before you right now, Lord, grow our church, save these cities, mature your people, bless and increase our finances, give us a bigger and better building, and send laborers into the field. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, church. Uh, looking forward to the message tonight. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, church. God bless you. Wonderful to be with you on this Wednesday night. I have something special for you. And before I get into that, please don't forget tomorrow night, or tomorrow and tomorrow night, prayer and fasting. Find a meal that you feel like is a sacrifice, and let's do this together as a church. A couple weeks ago, I was able to watch one of Brother Klein Dentz's uh, conference call. And as I began to watch that, Sister Dramus and I both knew immediately that we 
must share this with the congregation. Now, there is a brother, Warren Finney. Uh, he is a converted, he was an Assembly of God uh, speaker and pastor and conference speaker, and he is going to be ministering on, on this conference call, and we're going to share him and his story and his testimony. Look, there are people out there that God is dealing with. And you know, sometimes it's so easy to forget what God is doing for individuals, not just people collectively, but also individuals. And this man was being dealt with by the power of the Holy Ghost. He's going to share a very deep, powerful testimony. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be, I want you to get excited. I want you to make sure that you start with this tonight and you end with it because what goes on and what is said at the end is very important for Apostolic Faith Church also. God bless you. Enjoy this. Be encouraged. And, uh, and, and, and just worship. When it's over with, worship. And let the power of the Holy Ghost move in with you, Sister Jeremus. Because there are people out there that don't have whole truth. Yes. They're, they're yes. people. They have parts Sister Jeremus is, uh, is uh, iterating the people out there that does not. They do not have the whole truth. But God's working with it. We know what truth is. Come on. We know there's truth in there. The Bible is truth. And then those that vary from it. Uh, it's not it's not portraying the whole truth, but God is working on wonderful, good people, pastors, co-workers, co -workers and, and people, even priests. God is dealing with them. We're having testimony of, of a multitude of priests that are coming to the to the truth. And God is working in these last days. This COVID-19 is not is not a shutdown to the truth and to the church and to the power of the Holy Ghost. Enjoy this. Worship at the end. Have your your folks, those that are with you, y'all worship and praise God at the end of this. Be encouraged, Share Sister Dramus and I love you. And, uh, and yes, and uh, Sister Dramus and I were talking about this. This is something that you definitely want to share. Your, your, your family, your friends, and your co-workers. And they do not have whole truth. They're seeking God. They love God. They love church. They go to church. Just, hey, hey, I got something I want you to hear. I got some, something I want you to witness and, uh, and let them uh, share this, um, th th this video. God bless you. And in Jesus' name, I pray that you're encouraged. Let the Holy Ghost work with you and let God be exalted. So Harper, uh, talk to us about what's on your heart and introduce our very special guest, Brother Warren Finney. He's an evangelist with the United Pentecostal Church. And I've had an opportunity myself to spend a little time with him from moment to moment. Uh, a humble man, uh, a man that God's hand is on greatly, a man that has seen tribulation and persecution, but has pressed on and God is really blessing him. Brother Harper, I know you work with him quite a bit. Introduce our special guest. Well, let me begin by saying that it's my privilege and pleasure to be here. And I have great admiration for Brother Foster and Brother Clyde Dent for what they've done, especially for the evangelists nationwide, the United Pentecostal Church. But as we come to you today, I have a, a particular fondness uh, for the guest that's here today for this reason. He comes from the same background that my father came from. My father was a Church of God minister from Cleveland. Tennessee. And I remember as a three-year-old boy, my father standing up in a church service where the, we were guests with Brother D.W. Durst in Charleston, West Virginia at the Patrick Street Pentecostal Church. And my father stood up in a testimony service and he said, Brother Durst, I'm going to tell you something that my wife and children don't even know. He said, I I'm now ready to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. I'll never forget that service. It was awesome. And so out of that, I have understood and I, I have insight into the Trinitarian community, but also because of the revelation of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have great, great fondness for all Trinitarian ministers believing that if my father could make the change, and if others can make the change, then it, it's, it's, it's something that we can look to for revival. So through Brother Jim Stark and Brother Wayne Huntley, I was privileged to get acquainted with Brother Warren Finney. After we met 
and we began to interact and deal with one another, it became obvious that we had a commonality that would help us enhance each other. He calls me pastor. Uh, I've dealt with him and helped him. And I've, I've even made phone calls across the country, knowing where that there were some of his former affiliates from the Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Holiness, the Trinitarian circuits that he was in, and have called some of our ministers, and he's gone and ministered there and baptized pastors, baptized evangelists, baptized some of his old colleagues from the Trinitarian world. It's, it's been absolutely wonderful. This man has his birthplace from down in Arkansas, and uh, he pastored there, it was quite successful. He'll tell you his story, and as he tells you his story, you're going to be thrilled with the outcome. Uh, there are nine churches that he has baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now uh, the most recent is the one in Ada, Ohio, where the, just just uh, just two weeks ago, this coming Sunday, he will have baptized 93 Trinitarians in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think, well, he'll tell you more about it. I think there was four retired Trinitarian ministers that were there that also, along with the pastor and spouse, that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's my privilege to bring to you a man that comes from some of the circles of Southern gospel music, but he was a he was a guest speaker at the General Conference of the Assembly of God several times. He was one of their foremost camp meeting preachers, and he has preached camps for, for several of the Trinitarian organizations. You're going to enjoy it, and it's my privilege to present to you today Brother Warren Finney. God bless you, Brother Finney. Thank you for agreeing to come and talk to us. I greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus because there's not a greater name in this world that I could greet my brethren with. And I'm honored to be here on this call. And I give honor to my pastor, my bishop, Bishop Edwin Harper. And I just want to give a quick shout out to him and Sister Harper. Today is their 53rd wedding anniversary. And I want to say to them, happy anniversary. And thank you for all that you people have done for me. Brother Harper has become my pastor, awesome. and has been such a blessing. And many of the things that I share in ministry are things that he and I fondly laugh and say, the Lord hath made me to know through Brother Harper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell him all of my original stuff I get from Brother Harper. And uh, I recognize I, that statement. If you, if, you hear, if you hear much of my preaching, you will understand that I have a, a, a ghost writer. But uh, I am so excited to be with you. Thank you, Brother Klein Dentz, and I give honor to you. I give honor to Brother Bishop. Thank you all for accepting me in this fellowship of brotherhood. To have a brotherhood is absolutely phenomenal. I don't understand men who want to be out alone. I enjoy the fellowship of the brethren of, that the Lord has given me. When you walk through a venue like I have and you've spent time preaching this gospel, feeling like you were totally alone, to have fellowship and brethren means so much to me. I was born in I was I was born in a in a godly home, mom and dad in the Assembly of God Church that loved the Lord with all their heart. I was born in the year of 1972, raised in the church, and uh, raised holiness, raised with a standard, and to live a godly and overcoming life. The age of 10 years old. I heard a preacher preach on hell, and I made a firm decision that day. If I have anything to do with it at all, I'm not going there. And, uh, of course, when I went to find out how I was not going to go there, they led me in the sinner's prayer. And uh, when I got through, I didn't really feel a lot different. I felt a little peace because I cried and uh, wept and repented of sins, but never really felt like that that was the ultimate. A year later, at the age of 11, the evangelist came through and preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I, many of my cousins and friends were receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost there in that church. And I wanted to receive it as well. The end of the revival, I had never received the Holy Ghost. Many of them had. And the last night, the evangelist preached on this kind cometh but by prayer and fasting. At 11 years old, I said to my mother and my father, I won't be eating again until I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I remember my dad looking at me and said, son, that's a tall 
proclamation and a tall order. And uh, I kept true to that. That was on a Sunday night. And on Monday, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, went to school, didn't eat anything, just hungry for God. I just wanted to be used to the Lord, just wanted God to have his place in my life. On Wednesday night, we were having an ecumenical service. And, the, you know, for those of you who know what that is, where the ever denomination gets together, we pray for Colonel Sanders to be resurrected. We're going to have a wonderful chicken dinner at the service. And uh, they had a missionary Baptist preacher speaking in the service that night. And I remember as they turned the service to him, the service was as dry as cracker juice. And I leaned my face into my little 11-year-old hands, and this is what I said. Dear God, I do not know what I have done that keeps me from receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But whatever I've done, please forgive me and take it so far from my life that it never returns. I know now that's the night I truly repented. That's the night I give God everything. I don't remember anything after that, but two hours later, I come to, and I was standing in the corner of our little church there in Crossed, Arkansas, with my nose almost in the corner. I was shaking from the top of my head, the bottom of my feet, speaking in a language I'd never spoken in my life. And after it was over, I would find out that that had been two hours of an out-of-the-body experience that God had gave, given me. And I honestly thought for years that everybody who received the baptism of the Holy Ghost had an out-of-the-body experience. I didn't know that that wasn't something that happened, but I'm so thrilled that God allowed me to have it. The age of 12 on a Saturday night in a little single-wide rundown house trailer where our family lived, nobody wanted to visit us, but God came to visit our house that night. And he didn't come to talk to Mama, didn't come to talk to Daddy, come to talk to a 12-year-old boy. And that night, the God who needs no man to do anything invited me to carry his gospel for the rest of my life and it totally changed my life i began to preach at our home church and begin to preach kids revivals and youth revivals and god opened doors quite rapidly at the age of six, 16 my pastor my mother and dad made the decision we felt that it was time for me to go full-time on the road because i was having to make a decision would i go back to school this fall or finish my schooling on correspondence courses which is what i did at the age of 16 i went full-time on the on the evangelistic field that's been 31 years ago and god's been good to me i often laugh and say i've not had a real job in my life living for god and spreading the gospel has been my call and my job for most of my life so at the age of 21, I would marry 22, I would marry a very widely known Assembly of God pastor's granddaughter who happened to be a district uh, assistant district superintendent of our state. Thought we had the world by the tail. At the age of 21, I was the youngest man ever ordained in the Arkansas District of the Assemblies of God. And there God would begin to bless our ministry and open many doors and platforms that I humbly will have to say were probably much too big for me that probably caused me to become lifted up in pride and arrogant too quick. And God had to work that out. As I was at the age of 28 years old, I settled in Hamburg, Arkansas to pastor to plant a church. We started with five people. And before the, what was done, the Lord had magnified that church to well over uh, between almost 200 people and then began to grow even from there. At 18 years of pastoring, and I remember in 2010, sitting in my office as a Trinitarian preacher, writing my sermon for Easter Sunday. And while I was writing it, I'd ask people, if you have questions about the resurrection, would you please submit them? I would like to answer them in my Sunday morning and Sunday night camp meeting service that we were having. What I did not know is a local UPC, well, not a UPC, Independent Apostolic Church had split and some of those people liked our standard and just came filtered in our congregation. We had three families. They never caused me any trouble. They never mentioned this. I really honestly did not know they were apostolic. I just knew they had a standard like us and they loved us. And they began to meet once a week and pray that God would show their pastor the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. Never said a word to me. One of them would write a note and ask me, why did there have to be a bodily resurrection of Jesus? Why couldn't Jesus just went back uh, and, and never had to have a bodily resurrection? And of course, we all know it was the proof of, of the finished work. But I also began to, but God used that question. And I began to write these words. And I said, because had there not been a bodily resurrection of Jesus, we would have been like the Muslims and the Hindus and all of those who go to the grave of their leader 
and worship. And then I wrote this line because that body was not God. That body was the house that God lived in. And when I wrote that and I stopped and looked at it, I saw who Jesus was. I saw the mighty God in Christ and I stopped and I said, oh my God, I just wrote a oneness line. And I started to scribble it out and change it. And when I started to change it, the Lord spoke to me and said, go to the book of Genesis. So I went to the book of Genesis and I saw where I was made in two areas like God. I was made in image and in likeness. And in image, I have the body of Christ. But in likeness, I have the unique, unique ability that God has to slip in and out of a body. I'm born in a body. I'll die, I'll slip out of the body, but at resurrection, I'll put this dirt suit back on. And I realized that I was made in the likeness of God, eternal. I realize I'm a body, I'm a soul, I'm a spirit, but I'm one man. I remember looking and saying, oh God, what have I done stumbled into? And I, I'm making this very brief if I can. And there was much more to it. And I fell out of my desk chair into the carpet of my office that Thursday afternoon. And I began to cry profusely as God took me on a journey through the scripture and had to answer my Trinitary questions such as, okay, who was God talking to when God said, let us make man in our image? And later on, I would find that from Proverbs chapter 11 to the seven spirits of God, Proverbs, I mean, Isaiah chapter 11, verse two. And then I would find in Proverbs eight, where the seven spirits of God would literally speak and at the end declare they were there when he formed the foundations and the dust of the earth where he formed the mountains and he made the man and all of those things. Then as God took me on a journey, I'd ask about the thief on the cross and he began to show me ages and dispensations and how that in, in that three and a half year dispensation of the king, there was like four different throughout the scriptures ways to approach God. Abel offered a lamb. Moses required sacrifice according to your financial income and and then I began to see that in John 3, 16, I didn't see anybody really repent. They just looked at him and believed. Jesus might have told them their sin. The woman at the well, I didn't see her repent. I didn't see the thief on the cross repent. And I realized that in that three and a half year dispensation, nobody even fasted either because Jesus was right there. And so I realized that John 3, 16 was at the beginning of every dispensation. God spoke to men and showed them how to find him in that dispensation. And John 3, 16 was that dispensation's way to find the Lord. And as I sat there that day, the Lord reminded me, he said, you wouldn't tell anybody to offer a lamb to be saved. I said, no, that's not for us. He said, you a turtle dove or a bullock. No, that's not for us. He said, why are you preaching? John 3, 16 is the way of salvation of trusting and believing because that's not for you either. And he showed me how that dispensation ends when Jesus cried, it is finished. And then in the day of Pentecost, uh, when it was fully come, a new dispensation opened and right out of the bat, just like God did in every dispensation, when they asked, how do we find you? What do we do to be saved? We had the story from Acts 2.38 that told us how to be baptized. After about four hours of God taking me on a journey through scripture, answering all of my questions, such as the, as the, why could I blaspheme the father and not uh, the son and, and the Holy Ghost, but not the Holy Ghost. And he was showing me different. So he's son of God, son of man. And I began to see all of these things and God began to answer them to me. And I'm writing it down as fast as I could. When I got up from there, I sat down in my chair and I looked up at the ceiling and I said, God, what do I do now? And I thought I was going to hear a Joel Osteen voice out of heaven say, I was fixing to live my best life now. But instead, what I heard was the voice of the Lord's cry, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. And I said, now, God, we got a problem. I've already been baptized and I've already, I've already repented and I've already done all that. And then the Lord took me that day to, to Luke, where Luke said that two things in the name of Jesus would be preached, repentance and remission. And that day. I understood there's two things that is required, two messages, not just repentance, but there is two different things. We repent. And then I begin to look, how do I get my sins remitted? I begin to study Luke as a doctor using that medical term, remission, to take away. I begin to realize that this is the reason that some of our people repent a thousand times over things and never get the victory over it. They never took it to a watery grave and had it removed, remitted from their life and have like, like cancer put in remission. 
So I began to study on remission that day. And there I realized that according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. The Lord began to declare to me the power of his name and spoke to me that day and said, do some research on Matthew 28, 19. As I sat there on my computer looking at Matthew 28, 19, where he said, go all over the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I understand we can diagram the sentence and all that. But the Lord showed, dealt with me to do research. And it was that day that I discovered that Matthew 28, 19 was never even in that, that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was never even in the original words of Jesus. Because I'd always use this, well, Peter said that, Jesus said this, I'm going to go with what Jesus said. And it was there that day that I realized Jesus never said that, that in the original setting, he actually said in my name. And I found out that the Catholic Church in 530 AD had made that change. Also put in the book of John, where it says there are three that bear record in heaven. They had been inserted that in there as well. And as I studied all that that day, I come to the conclusion that there's only one God. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to be saved. And there's only one name that remits sins. And we must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. I got up from the floor that day and I didn't know anybody much that preached this gospel. But I had been in gospel music for many years and I'd sung with a major nationally known group in the, play, in the state of Oklahoma and Oklahoma City. There was a group there from Kansas and the man was out of Kansas. He's dead and gone now, but his family was there. And I had his number. This will date me. I had it on a Rolodex. Y'all remember those things? And I found his number and I called him. His name was Brother White. He was out of Kansas. And I said, Brother White, I don't know how to tell you what just happened to me. But I explained that Brother White had let me come and preach for him and let me come and sing. He had had this discussion. Stay off of your Trinitarian stuff, but I'll let you preach and sing. I called him. I said, Brother White, I don't understand why when I was not when I was Trinitarian, and you know it, that you let me come. He said, I've always debated that. Why did I do it? He said, but all I can tell you is God told me that I was supposed to use you and stay close to you because there would come a time you was going to need me. He was the only man I knew that I trusted. And I said, Brother White, if I come to Kansas, would you baptize me in the name of Jesus Christ? Wow. Picked up the phone and called my travel agent that I'd done a lot of traveling at the time through singing and preaching and doing conferences and I said, I need the quickest trip I can get to Wichita, Kansas, because I had to go out of ways. They was going to pick me up at the Wichita airport. I was going to drive a ways. My travel agent said, I can get you there in the morning. You can leave at 6 o'clock. You can be back uh, the next day and be back for your service, but it's going to cost you $1,440. I said, you have my credit card on file. I don't understand people that see this gospel that can be baptized for free that never do. I paid $1,440 hmm. to fly to Kansas. And the next night at 7 o'clock, I was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And when Brother White brought me out of the water, he laid his hand on my head and said, from this day forth, God's going to continue to give you more revelation than you could ever imagine. i got to speed this thing along. Needless to say, it cost me my marriage. It cost me the fellowship that I was in. And a man who sat on the board of the, of the Sinners of God looked at me and said, son, if you follow this oneness doctrine the way you're planning to, you're going to be like the guy who got in the canoe and paddled out in the sea by yourself. You know what happened to him? I said, no, sir, I, I really don't. He said, none of us do. He was never heard from again. I'm sitting in Brother Alan, uh, Brother Donnie Copeland's office at Apostolics United in North Little Rock. He's sitting over here as my witness. Was it a month ago, Brother Copeland? I baptized that man's widow. I baptized his daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's dead and gone. And his daughter said, I want to be baptized. She had heard me preach a sermon here uh, that I preached concerning uh, uh, correction, the sure mark of sonship. And I talked of God changing our course. And I give my testimony and, and a lot of dissertation I won't give here today about how we believe. She said, you convinced us, me and my husband are ordained ministers of the Sons of God, you convinced us that this doctrine is right, but I've got one problem. And I said, it's because you're afraid you'll be letting down your dad. Well, she said, sure. I said, well, don't you understand the Bible said now we see through a glass darkly and that these things come by revelation? She said, I do. I said, do you believe that when we walk through the door of death, we see everything as it really is? She said, Absolutely. 
I didn't want to just tell her your dad went to hell because I didn't want to lose, uh, lose the opportunity to work with her. And I said, well, don't you believe that if what we believe is the truth and I proved it by scripture that your dad knows it right now? She said, absolutely. I said, don't you believe your dad would be the first in line if he believes something was true to stand with us and be baptized in Jesus' name? She said, my God, you just freed me. And the Lord allowed her to be baptized. Millersburg, Ohio, a Church of God church, preaching one night, and I told my testimony, and I talked about how that Matthew 28, 19 was not even in the scriptures, and I said, you can Google it. We're in a Google age. The pastor's wife grabs her phone up. This has been five years ago, and she grabs her phone up and begins to go through the phone, forgets she's in church, and screams out, oh my God, he's right. The next night, I baptized her and her husband, the pastor. The next night, we baptized the rest of the entire church in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few months ago, I had the privilege to be with Brother Don Martin in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And there we would baptize a young man, a young minister that I preached with for many, many years that I knew his dad. We baptized him and his wife and son in the name of the Lord Jesus. His son got the Holy Ghost in the water. And I'm going to close right here for the Claudettes. I think I'm running a little over time. But I'm going to close right here. Sunday morning, I believe it was the 26th of July, I was scheduled to be with my pastor to go preach due to COVID. He's not had any cases there. I did, was. He asked me to be tested, and I went and got tested, didn't get our test back in time. And so we decided to postpone to be with Brother Harper at a later time. A Trinitarian church had been asking me to come. I told him my COVID test has not come back yet. It did come back the day before, come back negative. And so I went there to preach. When I got there, just thinking I was preaching, I'd had the most difficult night of my life the night before, a lot of emotion and the pain that I've dealt with the last several months and years. It just seemed to overwhelm me. God let me actually cry and grieve some things out that night. I got up the next morning and I said, I'm sure thankful I'm not in one of our churches where they don't expect me to produce today. Maybe these Trinitarians won't expect much. Really did I know what God had in store. I walked in that church and there's a female pastor and her husband asked me to come to their office. I got there and she said, they had heard the same message that I preached to Brother Copeland's that online that, that the others had heard. He said, you convinced us. We took that sermon and we played it in Bible studies on Wednesday nights and we broke it up in sections and we can't disprove it. There are four retired Trinitarian ministers, some Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecost Church of God, and, and we can't poke any holes in it. We've heard your testimony. And this is what they said. Brother Finney, we don't mean to impose on you. We don't have baptismal robes. And we are filling the baptistry as we speak. You can't stand behind it. You got to get in it. The water is going to be cold. But there's some of us today don't know how many that would like to be baptized in the name of Jesus because we believe what you told us. And we see it's the truth. I said, it's no imposition. I drive a Kia car and it's a rolling suitcase out there. I got plenty clothes. Brethren, I went in the water at 1120 after preaching a short 10-minute message on the power where Jesus, before God, he showed his glory to Moses. The Bible said, and the Lord proclaimed unto Moses his name. And I preached about understanding the name of Jesus before you can have unprecedented glory. But if you understand the power of the name, you can have unprecedented glory. I went in the water at 1120 thinking we'd baptize 10 or 12. I left that night. I left that evening and walked out of the water at 20 minutes till three o'clock. There was 94 people in attendance. 93 were baptized in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In three different meetings that week, over the course of the week, God let me baptize 102 people in one week's time in the name of Jesus. And we've seen over 20 receive the Holy Ghost. I hadn't got time. I'm not going to get into it. Had one girl at that service, Brother Harper, and I told him about this. Didn't even know what repentance was. I had to stop and explain repentance to her. But when I explained repentance, she repented. Come in the water, was baptized. Had never even been in a Pentecostal church before in her life. When I brought her out of the water, she was speaking in tongues as clear as a third generation Pentecostal. I come to tell you, God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll back up his word. He'll honor his word. And this is not a time with COVID. I've done so many parking lot services. We've seen mayors get the Holy Ghost. On, and I've literally seen a mayor and a county judge get the Holy Ghost in a parking lot service on the courthouse steps here in the state of Arkansas. 
I'm telling you, friend, this COVID is not the worst thing to happen to the church. It's something that's glorious. We've got a moment of opportunity to rise up. There's a world that's scared. There's a world that's afraid. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This week, God, in a week's time, has given me a motorhome and a flatbed trailer to go into cities and to use that trailer as a stage and haul my car on when I'm done. Give me a sound system, a brand new $4,000 keyboard, just outright give it to me. And I'm getting ready to go to the streets and not only in churches, but go to the streets and do some street services because I want this world to hear this gospel that will change their life like it did mine. I sincerely appreciate this moment. I think I went three minutes over and I'm sorry, but I just wanted to share what God has done for me. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.